Welcome everyone to this, the last, the 13th session of our book club, Reasoned Argument, The Counter to Cancel Culture. Tonight, the theme is going to be the progressive reconstruction of the Constitution. So let's look at our three think points for tonight. First, the administrative state's scaffolding, hiding, and reconstructing the Constitution. Second, what's the architectural design for reconstruction of the Constitution? And finally, the progressive reconstruction through culture. This first thing point is the administrative state's scaffolding, hiding and reconstructing the Constitution. I've used that metaphor because you can visualize a building maybe that you're familiar with, maybe an old building in which they're doing some remodeling or just repair. And you can't see it while it's being done. You don't know what's going on. You just assume that what's going on is going to improve the building or restore it. Well, when it comes to the reconstruction of the Constitution, it is a reconstruction, but it's hidden by the scaffolding. And that's a big part of what we want to talk about in this first session. In this section, I'm going to go through the headings in Chapter 8 of Professor Barnett's book. He starts off by giving a story about a foreign correspondent asking then-President Obama about when he's going to do or take a certain action regarding immigration. And the president responds in a way perfectly consistent with separation of powers. He doesn't have the power to do that. He has to wait on Congress. But then, as Professor Barnett points out, that administration goes on to do and runs around separation of powers. Indeed, that is both the progressive dilemma and the progressive modus operandi. That is, the reality is we have a system of separation of powers, but for over 100 years, it's all about eroding the separation of powers and figuring out end runs around them. So in this first section, Professor Barnett goes to the philosopher Locke and asks or goes over, what are the three things the government does or should do? And so that's what we're going to look at right now. The lack of known and standing laws to guide conduct. This is critical, and it's answered in the Constitution by the legislative branch. And so, as you can imagine, we're just going to go through the three. So the second point is the lack of known and impartial judge to settle disputes. That's critical in many parts of the world. They don't have certainly independent judges. They have, many places just don't have fair judges. They have corrupt judges. It's all too common. The third point, the inability of individuals to enforce their rights. Well, you can get a judgment in court, but if there is no enforcement of it, what good does that do? So on to the next section. He labels it checks and balances, but he's talking throughout about separation of powers. How can that be? Well, it is important, and I've said it before, to understand that the primary thing is separation of powers. But each of the powers has a checking function. But to adopt checks and balances instead of separation of powers would be to go back, possibly, to what the system in England that Thomas Paine so criticized, and which was of the view adopted. or it can mean the form of checks and balances that come along in the administrative state. There are other checks and balances. Why is this important? A lot of times people get frustrated with gridlock in Washington. And Justice Scalia used to say, yes, gridlock, that's what we need. Well, Justice Scalia was referring to the structural gridlock in the Constitution. There is a separate gridlock that makes things even more impossible. And that is the gridlock created by the administrative state. And how does this happen? We'll get to it. But what happens is that 
matters that should be handled by Congress are not. And they are instead kicked over to the administrative agencies. And that adds a new level in terms of gridlock, if you want to call it that. But the executive is supposed to execute, but Congress doesn't want to legislate, so it kicks it over to the executive branch, not to the president, really, but to the permanent bureaucracy to really make the political decisions. And that's not self-government. So next. This third one on weakening the president's power to check Congress with independent agencies and omnibus spending bills. When he taught his course in separation of powers, there was a big section in there about how Congress undermines the president through independent agencies. That to some extent is known and there is some emphasis on that. But the whole business of omnibus bills is very important. Madison worried about the deviousness of the legislative branch. And therefore, when it came to the veto, he put in extra protection. But it would have been great had he defined what a bill is, because what we have are monstrosities that cannot be read by any human being in the time allotted, say three days. Most Americans didn't know this until the famous statement at the time of Obamacare that we have to pass it in order to know what's in it. That is the antithesis of self-government. So next up, weakening the judicial constraint on the other branches by adopting deference and restraint. We've already gone over that to some extent. Certainly Professor Barnett covers it greatly in, in the uh, chapter that we already went over. That is chapter five. In that restraint business, I can't overemphasize enough that restraint in the abstract or general restraint is not what the Constitution provides. There are certain areas where the courts are supposed to act. You have a right to go into court in order to invoke and protect your rights. So next, and this may be the most important point as a practical matter right now, it's not about democracy, it's about power. And at the end of this, we'll talk again about power and how important it is to understand how it is actually structured. On to the next section, section two. What's the architectural design for reconstruction of the Constitution? The answer given by Woodrow Wilson is to make the government more democratic. But that's not the real purpose. The real purpose is to erode or displace altogether the structural restraints against Congress. That's what it's all about. And yet, it then results in moving congressional power to quote the experts. And this is what Wilson wanted, as well as many other, other progressives. They didn't think self-government could be trusted to the people or their representatives. After the Civil War, there is so much going on that there is no way to accurately summarize it here. All I can do is hit certain highlights and try to weave them together at a 50,000 foot level. So Professor Barnett in chapter five has already explained about how the Republican Constitution as now revised is being undercut, especially by uh, holdovers in the federal courts who are still looking backward in many ways and don't want to implement the amendments. But also there is, he says, and he's right, an important political shift along the way. In fact, there is a lot going on here that we put under the heading of progressivism but some of these things actually started before the Civil War, but they explode after the Civil War. That is, with the victory in the Civil War by the North, there is released a sense that we can really reform all kinds of things, since, after all, we have defeated slavery. Now, that, first of all, will go to such issues as the woman's right to vote, which started before the Civil War. And also alcohol 
the debate, the Christian opposition by some Christians to alcohol. Those two things carry over after the Civil War, and they're part of the whole progressive movement. But there are different layers and different types of people involved in the progressive movement, and that's what we have to keep straight. This post-war period is referred to as the Reconstruction period, but the Reconstruction of the South went for a certain period of time and basically it failed. And Professor Barnett covers that in chapter five. But there's another reconstruction that's going on that I've already referred to by focusing on the new president at the time of Harvard, that is Charles Eliot. And so what's going on is being in many ways led by universities and most prominently Harvard. So what are some of the ideas that are driving this movement or at least supporting this movement? Well, we've already mentioned, besides progressivism, the other isms. There is social Darwinism, there is scientism, although many would prefer simply to say science. And then there is the um, positivism that was championed by Oliver Wendell Holmes. All of this plays together in a very kind of complicated way. So let's see if we can sort out a few of the things. The, <clears throat> the progressive victories really start at the local level, both in reorganizing how uh, cities and counties are governed, and at the state level with the movement for initiatives and referenda, quote, to make things more democratic. And as we see in California, more chaotic as a result. In any event, eventually the movement moves from the local and state level to the federal level. And much of this is actually driven by the Supreme Court and its alcohol decisions. At one point, the prohibition movement was almost dead in the 1890s, but the Supreme Court decisions gave it new life and it leaped to the federal level in order to overcome decisions by the Supreme Court that prevented states from blocking the movement of alcohol from one state to another. And as most people recognize who study this area, the biggest federal victories that the progressives got were on the 16th and the 17th amendments, the 17th again, direct election of senators. And that was supported broadly by a populist movement that was democratic, not necessarily progressive in the elite sense. But as I said, there's many layers to this. Indeed, the movement towards direct election of senators began a long time before. The purpose of the Lincoln-Douglas debates in Illinois was to influence the selection of the senator by the state legislature. So there was that background and, you know, it ultimately over time changes. The movement for direct election of senators is from the states, not from the Senate. People in the Senate didn't want to run for election to a broad audience. But the terrible thing about it is that the states, because they didn't know or appreciate the structure of the Constitution, had no idea, because I read this stuff, that they were giving away virtually all of their power. If they'd only read the Federalist, which tells them, you are part of the federal government, and now you're taking yourself out. You're removing the check you have on the federal government. But that's water under the bridge at this point. The question then becomes the following. Today, we think of progressives as being on the left and in the Democratic Party, largely. But the reality is there's still progressives in the Republican Party just as well. They're just the right wing of the progressive ideology. But the election of 1912 was really <laughs> the best example of this. You had three progressives. You had the incumbent Taft, who was a progressive, a pro-corporate progressive, that is, 
he helped launch the uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And then you had the trust buster who had, had been president, Teddy Roosevelt. And then you had the progressive uh, Wilson, all three progressives. Now, Wilson ends up being president because the Republicans split. But many of the progressives were Republicans. Holmes was a progressive Republican. It was not uncommon. And indeed today, many Republicans that people refer to as rhinos, they're really progressives. They're just on the right wing side or the business side of the progressive movement. That is, they really don't know much about the structure of the Constitution. So when you realize what we're dealing with, it, it requires some more digging. And what neither our founding fathers nor George Orwell ever imagined was that they would be delegating their dirty work to private companies to do through the back door what the government cannot directly do. And is that what you door. get at then in Woke Incorporated, your book, that because basically you're saying that it's not the government doing it. It's government in coordination or like, a, hey, could you yeah. check on this for me? And then the corporations are all too willing to do it? Exactly. It's mutual back scratching. And that's crony capitalism 2.0. Very different than 1.0, where right now, this is now a new hybrid of big government and big business that I think is the real threat to individual liberty today. Back in 1980, it might have been big government alone. Today, it's not just big government. That's just half the story. Hmm. It is this new hybrid of big government and big business that's far more powerful because each can do what the other cannot. There was, until at least about 1910, a broad progressivism, and it, it continues. But this broad progressivism could be, on the one hand, that of Professor Bates, who wrote the lyrics to God Bless America, and I mentioned that when we started out. Or it can mean those people who are also attaching an ism to it, in particular, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes and positivism, because he has had such tremendous impact on the courts and the way lawyers think. So how do we sort out among these things? Well, in a very short time, there's not much we can do, but let's say the following. The whole idea of pro progressivism was widely shared because there was this sense of optimism that the human condition can be improved. That's why they chose the word progressive. Sounds like a good word. Of course, history is always progressing in a certain sense, but we're gonna see that they believe that the progress is always to the good. And they believe that until the First World War. And that's what had a huge impact on progressivism. It didn't kill it, but it had to change shape. So what's going on during this period? Well, in the 19th century, up till the end of the century, in schools, K to 12, students were learning and reading and understanding much better certainly than today, the constitution itself and its structure. In fact, many of them memorized it. And they had still these constitutional catechisms that I've referred to before. And when Wilson begins writing and he's critiquing our constitution as outmoded, and it needs to be viewed in Darwinian terms, he is frustrated that generally the American people are very happy with their constitution. And he says, you know, we've got to take, meaning the intellectuals, have got to take it on to point out the problems with the constitution. That is the intellectual driver of the elite understanding of progressivism. It is an ideology that may or may not affect, infect people who are not at that kind of level of understanding of progressivism. So what happens to change this? Well, around the turn of the century, progressives decide that students should be studying social studies. Not necessarily the Constitution, all will have some of that in there. But they want them to attune themselves, as you heard Wilson say last time, to the current circumstances, to the pragmatism of the situation. And of course, this leaves everyone adrift in their thinking 
from the text of the Constitution and the Declaration. Yes, we honor the Declaration every 4th of July, but what does it mean? And that's why we spent time looking at the meaning of the Declaration. But it becomes clearer when we go back and look a little bit more at what's happening at Harvard. So I want to look at this particular article and read it to you. So this is an article, again, from the Harvard Magazine, and it's titled, The Five-Foot Shelf Reconsidered. Why the five-foot shelf? Well, in 1909, the year he would retire, President Eliot was convinced to issue the Harvard Classics, and he made the selections for this 50-volume work, and he gave an introduction to that. Now, in this article, I want to read a few parts of it so that you understand his view and what he's presenting to the country at that time. By Adam Kirsch and published in November, December 2001. Elliot's introduction expresses complete faith in the intermittent and irregular progress from barbarism to civilization. The upward tendency of the human race. Justice Scalia never had agreed with that. He was always saying it might be that we're descending into barbarism, not necessarily getting out of it, or those words to that effect. He said that many times. So let's continue. Perhaps the most consequential difference between Eliot's time and our own has to do with science, a subject dear to Eliot a chemist at MIT when he was called to the presidency of Harvard. Well, so what is that difference? Well, we continue with the article. He's referring to Bacon as one of those included, obviously, in the selections for the Harvard Classics. So here, Bacon's confidence in the power of human reason is authorized by a touching faith that science and religion go hand in hand. This view of science, so different from the secular positivism of the 20th century, can be found everywhere in the Harvard classics. Wow, that really is interesting. In many ways, Eliot was very optimistic. And a lot of these things, apparently, he didn't understand the consequences of. And maybe that is attributable in part to the fact that he's primarily an administrator, although a scientist, and reflected in some of his choices that his focus is on science and not the broad humanities. After all, out of, in his classics, he left out Aristotle. How could you do that? Continuing, T.H. Huxley, and Huxley is a, a big supporter of Darwin. In fact, equally prestigious in London circles, scientific circles, as Darwin himself, and a supporter and writer on evolution. In his 1880 essay, Science and Culture, sounds the more familiar note of our own day, the overweening certainty that scientific knowledge is the only knowledge. He condescends to the Christian Middle Ages, gives a pat on the head to classical education, but admits no doubt about where the future lies. The modern scientific criticism of life presents itself to us with different credentials from any other. And he's quoting there. So Huxley and evolution, we'll talk about when we get up to the Scopes trial. Next. Again, from the Harvard article, talking about Eliot. The common theme in these Eliot selections and omissions is a settled distrust of abstract thought. In every case, and then he says, it is worth remembering that the major philosophical contribution of Eliot's Harvard was pragmatism, the doctrine that whatever works is right. Pragmatism doesn't give you any guide as to right and wrong. I mean, even without religion, 
if you have a basic understanding of classical philosophy, which is pagan, you understand the difference between right and wrong. You didn't have to be a religionist to accept the Declaration of Independence because the creator at that time before evolution could be in the deist sense. But there was a common understanding of human nature. Today, we can't say that. Today, there is a notion that human nature is merely a mental construct. Without that idea as a premise, you couldn't come up with transgenderism. It makes no sense in terms of anyone who understands or agrees with the idea that human nature in its basics is, a, is everlasting, at least in this life. To another article from the Harvard Magazine. This one in 2016 by Adam Cohen called Harvard's Eugenics Era. As he says at the end, this is not something that Harvard has published much about, understandably, not wanting it. But to give Harvard credit, the Harvard Magazine at least is publishing this article. I doubt they might publish it today, given the changed standards regarding open debate. In any event, let's read. In August 1912, Harvard President Emeritus, he had left the presidency in 09, as I said, Charles William Eliot addressed the Harvard Club of San Francisco on a subject close to his heart, racial purity. It was being threatened, he declared, by immigration. Eliot was not opposed to admitting new Americans, but he saw that the mixture of racial groups could bring about as grave a danger. Each nation, he said, should keep its stock pure. Eliot told the San Francisco audience, quote, there should be no blending of races. Well, Eliot, like Woodrow Wilson, studying in Germany, and you know what happened to eugenics in Germany. Eliot's warning against mixture of races, which for him included Irish Catholics marrying white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, Jews marrying Gentiles, and Blacks marrying whites, was a central tenet of eugenics. The eugenics movement, which had been in England and was rapidly spreading in the United States, insisted that human progress depended on promoting reproduction by the best people, of course, in the best combination and preventing unworthy, the unworthy from having children. It's hard to believe that well-educated people would believe this until you realize that they are looking through the ideology of progressivism. If you really believe that human beings and society necessarily are gonna progress and get better, then you have an idea of what it means to get better and it's not going in that direction. Then guess what? You're gonna to work to make it better as you think it is better. None of which is consistent with the equal creation of human beings. We thought we won that war in the Civil War. It wasn't won. And it wasn't just in the South that it wasn't won. It wasn't won in the universities and among the elites. And that's much more dangerous. Back to text. The former Harvard pre president was an outspoken supporter of another eugenics cause in his time, forced sterilization of people declared to be, quote, feeble-minded, physically disabled, criminalistic, or otherwise flawed. That's why I gave you to read Buck versus Bell. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Continuing, he also lent his prestige in the campaign to build a global eugenics movement. None of these actions created problems for Eliot at Harvard. Why? For a simple reason. 
They were well within the intellectual mainstream at that university. Harvard administrators, faculty members, and alumni were at the forefront of American eugenics. Founding eugenics organizations, writing academic and popular eugenics articles, and lobbying government to enact eugenics laws. And for many years, scarcely any significant Harvard voices, if any at all, were raised against it. Now, as I said, it's to Harvard Magazine's credit that at least they're willing to print this stuff. But there's also in the article, the appropriate statement. It wasn't just at Harvard. It was generally the case in many universities. And we know that that was true with Woodrow Wilson. It wasn't just that he was a racist, he was a eugenicist. In fact, they, get, they go together. If, if you think that one race or one class of people is superior to the other. Again, that this could take over the intellectual elite and the cultural elite in this country after the Civil War is really stunning. And the only thing you can really attribute it to is their loss of faith somewhere, either in religion or at least in the Declaration of Independence and in the Constitution. Where is this coming from? A lot of it comes, as I said, from Europe. So it's not surprising that Justice Holmes is the author of Buck versus Bell, which upholds the forced sterilization of an enfeebled mentally person in under an Oklahoma statute. What's surprising in some ways is that it was an eight to one decision. In other words, these were not just Brandeis and Holmes voting this way. There were others often considered conservatives. But as I said before, Republicans, as well as Democrats, everybody, at least among the elite, were progressives at this time. One of the other things that you ought to think about in going back, if you look at Buck versus Bell, is it cites the Jacobson case. And during this pandemic, that is a case that is being used to justify a lot of lockdown. And so, both of these cases reflect the criticism that Professor Barnett rightly makes against the unwillingness of courts to do their job to protect rights. In a later case, at least the court says, <laughs> before, you, before you are sterilized, you're gonna have to have due process, but we know how formalistic due process can end up being. So on to the next section, section three. Section three, progressive reconstruction through culture. The Harvard Magazine article by Kirsch, from which I read in the last section, talked about the shift to positivistic science. And this shift occurs after 1910, after the war, it really occurs in the 20s. And the notable point at which it does is the Scopes trial in Dayton, Tennessee, which we're coming up to. And the reporting on the Scopes trial is what really marks a break because of all the criticism in newspapers, even Southern newspapers against Bryant. And I'm not saying that Bryant did his best, but he didn't do as badly as some of them think. And I wanna try to show that when we go into Spud's reading of part of one of his arguments. In any event, the, it was set up to be a test case culturally. It wasn't about winning anything in the sense of, of the teacher, the scopes going to jail. In fact, Brian <laughs> offered to pay any fine that he got. So it wasn't that, it was a theater, a theatrical situation. Unfortunately, what people think they know about it comes from the theater, either the play or the movie Inherit the Wind. But the writers and the screenwriters of that didn't claim that they were following history. They created a work. They were engaged in rhetoric. They were selling a position. It's not pure history at all. But 
it had a huge cultural impact on top of the impact that actually occurred in 1925. Inherit the Wind is written in the play 19 or goes the play goes live in 1955. It's in the context of the McCarthy era, and the movie comes out in 1960. And we'll have a reading, as I said, from the trial transcript, not from the play, not from the play or the movie itself. But you'll see from the reading that Brian is not a dummy. One, he's read a lot about um, evolution. He knows the difference between the origin of the species and the descent of man. His attack is on the descent of man. That's where the real problem comes in, in a conflict between religion and science that had not existed as much before as indicated by the Harvard article. But it does after the Scopes trial as reported. So let's go and hear from Spud in his reading. And this section is an argument by Brian in support of his motion to exclude certain evidence, namely all the experts that the ACLU and Clarence Darrow wanted to put on. His argument was, in one sense, clear. We got a statute. They want to change the statute. They want to argue it's unconstitutional. As the right, as uh, Richard Weaver says in the Ethics of Rhetoric, the argument actually made by Brian is dialectically sound. The rhetorical argument in court by Darrow and later in the play and in the movie is rhetoric. It's an argument for a position. It's not simply based on science. So let's hear from Spud. My contention is that the evolutionary hypothesis is not a theory, Your Honor. The legislature paid evolution a higher honor than it deserves. Evolution is not a theory, but a hypothesis. Huxley said it could not raise to the dignity of a theory until they found some species that had developed according to the hypothesis. And at that time, Huxley's time, there had never been found a single species, the origin of which could be traced to another species. Darwin himself said he thought it was strange that with two or three million species, they had not been able to find one that they could trace to another. About three years ago, Bateson of London, who came all the way to Toronto at the invitation of the American Academy of the Advancement of Sciences, which, if the gentlemen will brace themselves for a moment, I will say I am a member of the American Academy for the Advancement of Science, they invited Mr. Bateson to come over and speak to them on evolution. And he came. And his speech on evolution was printed in Science Magazine. And science is the organ of the society, and I suppose is the outstanding organ of science in this country. And I bought a copy, so that if any of the learned counsel for the plaintiff had not had the pleasure of reading Bateson's speech, that they could regale themselves during the odd hours. And Bateson told those people, after having taken up every effort that had been made to show the origin of species and find it, he declared that every one had failed. Every one. Every one. And it is true today. Never have they traced one single species to any other. And that is why it was that this so-called expert stated that while the fact of evolution they think is established, that the various theories of how it come about, that every theory has failed. And today, there is not a scientist in all the world who can trace one single species to any other. And yet, they call us ignoramuses and bigots because we do not throw away our Bible and accept it as proved that out of two or three million species, not one is traceable to another. And they say, that evolution is a fact when they cannot prove that one species came from another. And if there is such a thing, all species must have come commencing, as they say, commencing in that one lonely cell down there at the bottom of the ocean that just evolved and evolved until it got to be a man. 
and they cannot find a single species that came from another. And yet they demand that we allow them to teach this stuff to our children, that they may come home with their imaginary family tree and scoff at their mother's and father's Bible. I want to speak to the trial tactic and the argument, not the science. So first of all, he did his homework and he's citing Huxley who had criticized and then cooperated with Darwin and who has no love for religion, as you can tell from the quotation from the earlier Harvard Law Review. He has a, some kind of a science background. I don't know how credible it is. He respects science, in other words. He has humor. He makes the argument. He goes to the jugular. And at the end, where he talks, this is not the end, this is the break, but where he talks about children in the family, that's where he's referring back to the descent of man, not to the origin of the species. So let's finish out with this second section of Spud reading. Now, my friends, I want you to know that they not only have no proof, but they cannot find the beginning. I suppose this distinguished scholar who came here shamed them all by his number of degrees. He did not shame me, for I have more than he has. But I can understand how my friends felt when he unrolled degree after degree. Did he tell you where life began? Did he tell you that back of all these that there was a God? Not a word about it. Did he tell you how life began? Not a word. And not one of them can tell you how life began. The atheists say it came some way without a God. The agnostics say it came in some way they don't know whether with a God or not. And the Christian evolutionists say we come away back there somewhere, but they do not know how far back. They do not give you the beginning. Not that gentleman that tried to qualify as an expert. He did not tell you how life began. He did not tell you whether it began with God or how. No, they take up life as a mystery that nobody can explain. And they want you to let them commence there and ask no questions. They want to come in with their little padded up evolution that commences with nothing and ends nowhere. They do not dare to tell you that it ended with God. They come here with this bunch of stuff that they call evolution that they tell you that everybody believes in but do not know that everybody knows as a fact and nobody can tell how it came and they do not explain the great riddle of the universe. They do not deal with the problems of life. They do not teach the great science of how to live. And yet, they would undermine the faith of these little children in that God who stands back of everything and whose promise we have that we shall live with him forever by and by. They shut God out of the world. They do not talk about God. Darwin says the beginning of all things is a mystery unsolved by us. He does not pretend to say how these things started. Now, if this theory that God did not create the cell, then it could not be reconcilable with the Bible. Well, of course it could not be reconcilable with the Bible. There would be no contention about that. But our contention is, even if they put God back there, it does not make it harmonious with the Bible. The court is right that unless they put God back there, it must dispute the Bible and this witness who has been questioned whether he has qualified or not. And they could ask him every question they wanted to. But they did not ask him how life began. They did not ask whether back of it all, whether if in the beginning there was God. They did not tell us where immortality began. They did not tell us where in this long period of time between the cell at the bottom of the sea and the man where man became endowed with the hope of immortality. They did not, if you please, and most of them do not go to the place to hunt for it, because more than half of the scientists of this country, Professor James H. LaBelle, one of them, and he bases it on thousands of letters they sent to him, says more than half do not believe there is a God or personal immortality. And they want to teach that to these children and take that from them to take from them their belief in a God who stands ready to welcome his children. As a result of this trial and the ridicule heaped on Brian, evangelical Protestantism suffered a severe cultural blow. Since then, in more recent years, 
it has bounced back in many ways. But the secular positivists are still there. Is there any way to bridge the gap? Well, first of all, it really comes down to reason. And one of the issues is how do you separate science from religion in the sense that each has its own academic territory? That doesn't mean that Christians have to give up their Christianity or Jews have to give up their Jewishness in order to study science. They don't. It's a matter of understanding, as Aristotle did, that there are different sciences and not claiming that all science is the science that certain people call science. Remember the discussion about science being an organized body of knowledge. Indeed, in the Federalist, early on, it talks about, quote, the new science of politics, meaning not a physical science, but even according to Woodrow Wilson, an understanding of learning in light of Newtonian physics. That was not all, because they understood human nature. It seems to me that if it is possible to recover any kind of bridge here, it has to be grounded in human nature and the reason of human nature. And that still is going to be very difficult. That is to say, we're not all going to agree on religion or whether there is a God or isn't a God. But if we could only agree on what there is by way of reason, that would be a big jump. But insofar as people think that reality isn't real, but it's just a mental construct, that is extremely difficult to get over. Eric Vogelin, a great political philosopher said, Thomas Aquinas, the great medieval Catholic theologian philosopher, had no trouble speaking the same language with the Muslims who are philosophers. But we can't even understand each other and we can't understand the founding, what's happened. There's a division about reason and human nature. And even the ancients, Aristotle, Plato, they knew they didn't create themselves. They knew that there had to be some force or power beyond them. They were not Christians, they were not Jews, but they were not idiots either. They understood that there is such a thing as causation, and one thing causes another. And then at some point, there is an uncaused cause. Call it what you will, but it is a recognition that there is a way to think about human nature. There are ways to think about the scientific aspects of human nature, and there are ways to think about the mental processes of human beings. In any event, unless we get that kind of agreement, which is based on reasoned argument, which means that you can't suppress all argument, then we're likely to continue in the kind of division we've had. And what does that mean? Remember in chapter eight of Professor Barnard's book, it's all about power then. That's what positivism is. Whoever holds the sovereign power gets to make the laws. Well, if we're in that kind of situation, it is going to be very difficult. Moreover, it is difficult because culture really dominates. The Supreme Court really is nothing more, unfortunately, in the hands of progressives, other than a transmission belt for culture. That is, it takes the ideas of advocates who are presenting cultural ideas, and if they are accepted, they transmit them and, quote, they become law because Holmes tells us, whatever the court says, that is law. That is not a good prescription in terms of understanding and communicating and living in one nation.
One of the reasons why reasoned argument is so difficult today is because the national and indeed world audience has so expanded that it is difficult to get to an audience with a message that the audience can understand as a group. What do I mean? Every speaker who is attempting to persuade has to understand the audience. But the audience has changed as a result of technology. We saw at the founding that much of the argument was in newspaper op-ed articles or in speeches given in court or maybe publicly. But the options today are so many more and we, the audience is both bigger and more fractionated due to technology. Just think of what a simple thing like a microphone does to the speaker. That is, you don't have to yell anymore. You can go through the microphone. And then when radio and television come along, certain corporations end up dominating the field. In fact, it was so strong during the 1960s, and especially in the 70s, when you had three networks only before cable, that Lyndon Johnson said he lost the fight in Vietnam when the chief news anchor for CBS, Walter Cronkite, who was highly regarded, turned against the war. And he's, Johnson said, I've lost. And that was one of the big reasons why he declined to run for re-election. That was the power and continues to be the power, but it's shaped differently. The three networks have lost much of their power to cable. And cable is now fighting other media, social media. So the medium really is the message. That was a line coined by Marshall McLuhan, a rhetorician in the 1960s. A lot of media people thought it was really a hip phrase. They didn't understand it. But what he meant was that form controls substance. So today, if you have something to say, where do you say it? Look, we've got some great intellects in the US Senate, but how are they gonna get their message out? Who's going to run it? The reality is that the media that we have, certainly television and cable, they're in the business of selling ads. And if you're not saying something provocative, meaning an attack on somebody, they're not interested in running it. So unfortunately, what it does is to tempt people to speak in ways that if they had a clear shot at an audience, they wouldn't speak. Okay, so now social media and this medium that I've enjoyed using for these 13 weeks allows me to speak in a way, maybe not to that many people, but it allows me to speak. And I can put it out there on YouTube and, and the other places, at least until I'm canceled. But there are very few opportunities outside the classroom to do that. And how big is one's class? Not nationwide, not worldwide. So those who have power, whether it's cable, whether it's the networks, whether it's the newspapers, they don't want to lose power. As they see themselves losing power, they can't do anything about it with regard to some people. They can't really battle Google or the other large social platforms like Twitter. Now it's been shown that Google and Twitter, Facebook, that's where the real power lies. And it's very difficult in order to get the admission in terms of the amount of money that one would have to get to come up with a competitor. So what do they want? What would everybody in power wants to get rid of the competitors? And if you see explosion on your network, what you think is yours, then what you're gonna do if you don't like that message is you're gonna crush it. And that's what's happening to conservatives and libertarians. So if that continues, what we have is the suppression of reasoned argument. And reasoned argument really is the only way if any way is possible to bridge the terrible divide that we have in the country.
So I am finished with this series, but I want to leave you on a little lighter note. For almost all of these sessions, I've had a reading from my good friend, John Spud McConnell, an actor in hundreds of movies and several major television series, but you haven't gotten to see him. So what I want to end on is one of his shortest movie appearances, but also the most iconic. So let's see it. And stay out of the Woolworth. We might say that in showing Mr. Clooney the door, he was engaged in a form of cancel culture. Thank you for joining me for all of these sessions or any of these sessions, and good night.